Hey folks, Dennis LaPelle here with Midwest Outdoors and to my right is Dan Ferris and Dan Keith. You may know them better as the voices of Midwest Outdoors television. And we'd like to welcome you to this special episode of Midwest Outdoors. We've been on the air since 1985 and this is our 2000th episode. We're glad you could join us today. It all starts right here, right now. I'm Gene Lawlinen, and welcome to this week's Midwest Outdoors magazine. We've got a great show for you, so be sure to stay with us because it's a keeper. You are turned on to Midwest Outdoors magazine. Since 1967, helping people enjoy the outdoors. As mentioned at the intro of the show, Midwest Outdoors Television has been on the air since 1985. We had a very interesting start, and we're gonna let our founder, Gene Lawlinen, tell you that story. We were having great success with the Midwest Outdoors magazine, and we were growing fast, but we thought there was a way we could grow even faster, and that is to get in the television market, but we didn't know anything about it. Then all of a sudden, 20 years ago, Joe Wire, died in a plane crash while filming a hunting show and he had the only outdoor show in Chicago. We were wondering who was going to take the show over. So we investigated and nobody had plans to take it over so we said let's do it. And that was the start of the Midwest Outdoors TV show. It's time for the Midwest Outdoor Show. Brought to you in part by Midwest Outdoors Magazine. Over 20 years of helping people enjoy the outdoors. There we were, we decided to go into television and we really didn't know what to do. The only thing we knew is that we had a tremendous talent base of all the writers that write for Midwest Outdoors. So for our first show, we gathered together Ray Hansen, Jim Gamlin, and myself, and we put the show together. And it was really exciting. Over the years, over a hundred different people have hosted our show. That's why we get a wide variety of talent and interest. Uh, everyone looks at something a little bit differently and uh, that brings a nice energy to our show. We don't have one hero, there's a lot of heroes. And that's why they do such a nice job. They only have six minutes to tell their story, so they gotta get it right and do it fast and do it well. One of the things that's been so rewarding is the people and places that we've gone to, the people we've met and the places we've gone to. Uh, over the years, uh, we have been as far north as Alaska and the North Pole, almost, all the way down to Costa Rica and the Baja. Uh, we've been all over the United States and we've met some wonderful people. Uh, the outdoor people are great people to work with. They're just it's the greatest industry. I've been so lucky to be involved in, in an industry that uh, the people you work with are, are so nice. And that's what we find out as we travel across the country and go to lodges and visit uh, fishing guides and manufacturers and things around the country. The outdoor people seem to be wonderful. We feel so lucky to have all these wonderful experiences, but the best part of it is we're able to share those with all our viewers and readers. So many of them have taken trips as a result of what they see on in our program, and then later they write us and tell us what a wonderful time they had and a memory that they developed that'll stick with them forever. The future of Midwest Outdoors looks really good. Uh, we have over 100 people that we draw from our talent pool that bring these rich, exciting shows that we have. Uh, and our market's increasing all the time, where there's a bigger demand for advertising space and there's a bigger demand to see our show throughout the whole Midwest outdoors, you know. And so we're, gonna, we're, we're going full steam ahead. We're going to continue to go, continue to grow. Uh, if you don't grow, you, you go backwards. All of us here at Midwest Outdoors uh, really appreciate the job that we have and 
Simply put, it's helping people enjoy the outdoors. There's a lot more to explore out there. There's a lot of lakes that haven't been fished. And there's a lot to learn about the outdoors. So Dan, I've been with the uh, show for almost a thousand episodes since you hired me. You've been with it for almost all 2,000. Now, you've got to have put well over a million miles on your personal vehicles. I bet you've seen some incredible things. Uh, share with us uh, you know, some of your most favorite moments happening out on the road. Everybody I filmed, I really enjoyed spending time with. But what I looked forward to was seeing the sunsets, the sunrises, the nature, especially the nature, moose, bear, caribou on the shorelines. I absolutely looked forward to seeing that part. One of my favorite memories is one of the earliest memories I've had with Gene Nall and Dan Ferris up in the boundary waters. And I'm hearing this drumming in the woods and it's not too far away. I make my way into the woods, the sun has just come up and I found this log that has a ruffed grouse drumming. And I just kept working closer, closer and closer until finally, I was on the log with the grouse filming. Now that critter is probably just as famous on the show as many of the guests we've ever had. But another critter that is almost equally as famous is Larry Ladowski. I got him. Well, that was just weight. You just feel the weight when you had to set the hug. <laughs> there was no chomp, there was no bite, it was just weight. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow, that's a football. That's a gorgeous fish right there. Right back down the bottom. Wow, Larry Ladowski here on another fantastic trip to Lake Erie. Over the 30 years that I've been doing this, it's hard to pick a one most memorable trip. There's been Big fish, small fish, no fish, you name it. Plane crashes, two fish caught on one lure, unbelievable. But if I had to pick one, I'd probably be with a guy by the name of Colby Sims about 15 years ago. I was fishing down in Kentucky Lake and Colby says, come on over to Lake Kincaid and we'll do a muskie shoot. So we're fishing, first thing out in the morning, we go into the stick bay or stump bay. We're fishing and all of a sudden, Colby's rod just gets ripped right out of his hands. He turns to me and he starts apologizing. Larry, that's never happened before. I've never had a fish take a rod out of my hand. And we're just standing there looking at each other and the rod's sitting about five feet in front perpendicular to the boat. The butt ends up out of the water because it's a cork handle. Rod tip goes down just like a bobber, it comes back up. And I look at Colby and he looks at me as if we're saying, did you just see what I saw? Before I know it, Colby dives off the boat. Oh. Still on there. <laughs> He's still on. He's Grabs still the out. rod, hoists it up over his head, and he starts fighting this fish on the other end. I'm laughing so hard. I pick up the, the net, get on the trolling motor, I motor over to him land the muskie that he's sitting there fishing from the water. I wound up doing a close right then and there because there was nothing better gonna happen during the day. But there's two things that you don't know about that shoot that are behind the scenes. Number one is when Colby jumped in the lake, the first thing he did was fry out the microphone, the $500 microphone that allows us to talk to the camera. The second thing is Colby's wet from head to toe. So what we have to do, since that was the first fish caught in the day and I had to close it out because Nothing that special is going to happen after that. We had to drive into town, find a laundromat, put his clothes in the dryer, get back on the lake, and finish the shoot. Oh, I got one too. You got one too. I got one too. <laughs> this might be a little, this might be a little smaller of a fish. No, I think this one's a smaller fish. Yeah. Oh, sweet. But I'd have to be remiss if I didn't say that fishing with my three kids, that was something special too. And anytime you can spend time in the boat with friends and family, it's priceless. Now, Dan, you've been with the show since episode number one. Now, over the years, you have got to have had some incredible moments, incredible memories that you've experienced with Midwest Outdoors. Many, many great moments. I remember we had Hall of Fame fisherman Mick Thill on the show. 
and he was touting his bank fishing methods and the effectiveness of them. He hands me a pole. First lift, I had two fish on one hook. And we've also had entertainers on the show, Ted Nugent, uh, Grammy Award winner Brittany Howard. We've had a lot of great fishermen, including Al Lindner, Kevin Van Dam, Mike Iaconelli. We've also had some sports celebrities, Kent Herbeck from the Minnesota Twins, Brian Urlacher from the Chicago Bears. One of my favorite days was a day out in Lincolnshire, Illinois, where we brought the Better's Boys Foundation out from the city of Chicago, and we were joined by Hall of Fame NFL player Walter Payton. And we just had a great day on the water with Walter, teaching about 100 kids how to fish. And really, Dennis, it's been a blessing being a part of Midwest Outdoors since episode one. Well, you know, it's such a, a blessing to do what we do and, and like you said, all the great people we've met along the way and all the stories and all the, the fish catches and the travel and, you know, for me, um, you know, Gary Roach, you know, legend, Hall of Fame fisherman, Mr. Walleye, kind of took me under his wing when I first started in 92 and, and we ended up traveling all over together. We went to Alaska for 10 years running. We just had tremendous, obviously, fishing in Alaska in such a beautiful place and being able to hang out with Gary, learn so much from him over the years. Um, our trips to uh, Ontario, Manitoba and Saskatchewan to film together. On the trip up there, I caught my personal best northern pike, a 48 incher with Gary in the boat and it was one of those last half hour, the last day fish, you know, so <laughs> this is a really cool memory there. And, um, you know, also just fishing with them on, you know, lakes like Mille Lacs and Winnebagosh, winter and summer. And again, learning so much from him, you know, he gave me a couple of great fishing tips, uh, more, more than one over the years, but two that are really stick out um, are him saying, they bite when we get there, Raj. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's something I still say to my kids and other people in the boat when they start to, you know, wonder why we're still putzing around looking for them. <laughs> uh, and that was me on Mille Lacs. You know, it's like, come on, Gary, hurry up, let's fish. And he's like, when we see, first we see the fish and then we catch the fish on his old Lowrance, right? And it's like, even back then, the electronics was, you know, something you leaned into as far as, you know, we're going to put our time in on the water and we're going to find them and then we're going to catch them. Many, many of the segments I've shot over the years are memorable, but I always remember the one up on Lake of the Woods in an ice house at Arneson's, Ted Takasaki, Mark Arneson and I, and we were done with doing all our filming for the week, and we just went out in the morning just to kind of goof off. And uh, we were in a fish house, and we said, let's bet a dollar on every fish that we catch. And, you know, of course, wintertime on Lake of the Woods, you're catching lots and lots of fish, and... So the dollars are going back and forth furiously in the fish house. Every time someone caught one, dollar back, dollar over here, dollar over there. So while we're going back and forth trading these dollars, Takasaki's one of his fish's snags in my line. And so I set the hook and I start fighting this fish and it feels like a big walleye, you know? So I would go right into host mode and start talking about how oh, this Lake of the Woods has got a lot of big walleyes and everything in it. Look at this, folks. The rod is just, I'm not even reeling him. He's going the other way. And every so often you'll get a real big fish that'll come through. Either a big and Ted's behind me tugging on his line and making it seem like the fish was thumping its head and everything. And we got him on camera just here. cackling with laughter, like right? Artisans, well, I'm playing it up and then I probably turn around like, oh gosh, Ted. <laughs> I still got a fish on here. I still got a fish on here, don't I? Or am I purely tangled with you? <laughs> You're gonna wake up with your hand in a glass of warm water thing. And your bed's gonna be wet. You know, it was, but it was a really popular segment. I remember people just, just getting a lot. We got a lot of feedback at the office from how fun it was, just three guys goofing off, passing bucks back and forth, you know. Talking about crazy fish stories with Tangled Blind. One of my memories from Zippo Bay. End of the day, we're uh, trying for one big one. We got uh, three, four guys fishing. I think we had at least six lines down, set the hook on a big fish. It was a big northern. And just like they tell you, in, in less than two seconds, you could hear all the rods dragging across the floor. And they were gone. All of them went down the hole. Get this rod out of the hole to my right. You got it. going on here. Another big northern. Come on, baby. You got him? Look at that. Woohoo! 
There's the beauty. Probably a 36, 38 inch northern. And the close of the TV show was all those fishing rods coming up the, or up the, the hole. So we got them all back. <laughs> when it comes to fishing action or crazy fishing, probably uh, over there at the Port of, Port of Sheboygan fishing with Dumper Dan, uh, that's the one thing I might not ever have done without, uh, you know, uh, working with Midwest Outdoors is go over there and fish the salmon, the kings and the cohos. Um, you get that coho bite going right away and the, when uh, the water starts warming up, um, action is great. And a lot of times there, the two most memorable trips are right off the uh, end of the jetty or the pier there. Then them cohos roll up in uh, May into early June and that same location, uh, we were filming a, a King Salmon show when they're coming in. Dennis had a, one of his buddies up. We had hooked up, I think, three at once. We lost one of them. Dennis's buddy was hooked up the whole time, and of course, we're filming a TV show, so Dennis doesn't want the clickers on. And uh, I'm fighting this 20, 25 pound king, and we think everything's all right back there. And uh, all of a sudden, boom, that's the end of the line. So that fish spooled out probably 300 yards of line. And Dennis had his way not to have any sound and Dump forgot there was a fish running a long ways. It was probably much bigger than the king I caught, but uh, that is probably the hardest fighting fish in size. I mean, everybody talks about that, but uh, a king battle is a heck of a battle. You know, we talk about blessings all the time, being able to bring fishing to you guys on television and tell our stories and share with you all the great places to go fishing and how to catch them. And obviously my greatest blessing has been being able to take my kids to work a lot um, and having them join us, whether they were uh, in the boat with me when we were working and making a show or not. And I've got a really fond memory of my, my younger son, Nicholas. And, you know, he was seven or eight years old and, and we were up in Crane Lake and it was him and dad in the boat, we were fishing smallmouth, and he put a clinic on. I mean, he schooled dad, and you can just see in the segment, his chest is puffed out, and he's so proud and so happy that he, quote unquote, held his own in the boat and made a real fishing show with his dad, as opposed to just being in the boat giggling and catching a few fish. And real proud papa moment uh, there with that segment. And, you know, we, we went on a lot of trips together, the boys and I, you know, up to Showalters on flying trips to Canada, and, you know, just catching 100 fish per person per day and all the houseboat trips over the years and um, just fishing, of course, recreationally with them and um, getting photos from Midwest Outdoors magazine, all of that has been a really tremendous blessing for me as, as a father to be able to bring the kids to work so much. Dan, we usually end the uh, episode with uh, a tip of some sort, or sometimes multiple. Uh, now, over the years, you have had to have gotten some invaluable fishing advice out on the road. Oh, there's so many great tips we've gotten that I'm going to mention one fisherman, Jim Sarek. Something that he did was the way he paid attention to detail. His attention to detail was second to none. Constantly sharpening hooks, checking his uh, rigging, checking all his connections that in a boat, sometimes you want to be staring at your electronics. Jim was constantly surveying the water, looking at electronics. Jim was very aware of the world around him, getting cues as to where things might be happening, getting cues as to where things are going to take place. You know, over the years, you get to meet a lot of people and you get, uh, get to talk fishing and some of the things that stick out, you know, Old timer in Mankato told me one time, well, you either fish them shallow, deep, or on the edge. And that was the progression he was referring to. Um, heard it said once that those fish have fins, they're loose, and they swim around, which means them fish are moving all the time. And I got the chance to do some work up at Camp Fish and hang out with Al Linder for a little bit. He gave, gave a great speech. and said something that made sense. He had learned it the hard way himself. The fish are always biting somewhere. You know, someone a long time ago gave me a good piece of advice that I try to remember every time I go out. And that advice is, if your line's not in the water, you're definitely not gonna catch fish. And it's true. You can change out lures, you can, if, but if a presentation is working, you wanna keep your line in the water at all costs. You'll put a lot more fish in the boat. You can change line, you can experiment, but if that line is not in the water, you're definitely not gonna catch fish.
We'd like to thank the dozens of producers and the hundreds of hosts that have helped make Midwest Outdoors the great show it is. We'd also like to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in week after week and for joining us here on our 2000th episode.